you ever heard of the Burkhardt Spore Trap? If you have, you're a step ahead of me. I'm at the University of Melbourne in the CBD, and I'm heading onto the top of this building to find out why they've got one mounted on the roof. Wow, Ed, this Whoa. is not... <laughs> what a view, eh? Oh, look at the city over here. Yeah. Associate Professor Ed Newbigin is a biologist who's been specialising in pollen allergy research for over 25 years. And Ed's work is centred around this unassuming but very important little machine. The Burkhard Spore Trap has been quietly chugging along here for decades, taking daily samples of the pollen in Melbourne's air. Very simple machine. It's got a, a motor down here, yep. which is sucking in air through this little nozzle here at 10 litres per minute. Good. So if you ever get asked in a trivia quiz <laughs> what the rate we breathe at, it's 10 litres per minute. So this I is shall trying remember to, that forever. Uh, <laughs> but this is trying to impersonate a human nose. Yes. Uh, so that little slot there is taking all the pollen in that's coming from this direction. Yeah, and then yep. behind that, we've got a clockwork motor. Yep. And then we've got a glass microscope slide here. Yep. So over 24 hours, we get a representation of whatever pollen is in the air smeared across this microscope slide. And you change that over every day? We change that over every day. Wow. Now, let's just remind people, what is pollen? Because it's sort of an invisible thing, if yeah. you like. Well, the closest analogy that we have uh, in the human body is sperm. For a plant, they produce both pollen and eggs, yeah. and then the magic of producing a seed happens when that pollen reaches the egg cell and fertilisation occurs. So how does pollen get from out there right into the CBD? Basically, there's two ways in which plants get pollen to the female reproductive tract. And one of those is the most familiar to everybody, and that's using birds and animals to carry pollen around. But we're not interested in that type of pollen at all, because that rarely gets into the air. What we're interested in are plants that use wind, and we've got a lot of wind <laughs> at the moment. It's a doozy of a <laughs> day. That's a great day for wind-pollinated plants. And yeah. they're just producing huge amounts of yeah. pollen, because the chances of any one of those pollen grains reaching a flower is minute, yes. minuscule. Yes. And so they have to produce a huge amount of pollen for to have any chance of success at all. Wow. And so we get that through our nose yeah. when it's around, and our little machine here, our little friend, <laughs> sucks it in and it does the same thing. To see the pollen properly, we're going to need to use the microscope in Ed's lab in the northern suburbs. Once we get back to the lab, we take the slide uh, and just put a few drops of a stain called Calberla stain, which colours the pollen grains pink. Uh, and we put a cover slip on that, and then we seal around the cover slip with some nail polish. And when that's all dry, we're ready to look at it under the microscope. So what's happening in this room? Well, this is the Pollen Count Central. This is where a lot of the pollen counting goes. Pollen counting is a manual process that people get on the microscopes and they go across and they look at each pollen grain and they identify the types of pollen that have been captured on our slides. It can be hundreds, if not thousands, of pollen grains, and that can take a while to My count. Goodness. It's an amazing job. And how many people are involved in that? Oh, well, we can have up to 10 people in here. Uh, it's seasonal work. It's this time of year, the spring and early summer time of year, when a lot of the plants are flowering and producing that pollen. So what are we going to see from yesterday? Oh, well, let's have a look. Oh, wow. Whoa. OK. <laughs> He's a cutie. Yeah. This is pine pollen. We think of it as looking like Mickey Mouse. It's got two big ears <laughs> on it, just like Mickey Mouse. So those are big air sacs. So ah. this is a, a classic feature in Wind pollinated plants helps it fly, helps it float in the air. Wow. And these, these pollen grains can travel hundreds, if not thousands, of kilometres. So, what's this one? Uh, this is public enemy number one. This is grass pollen. Ah, now that's obviously dispersed by wind, mm -hmm. and there must be thousands of them in the air. Yeah, well, we've got grass from here to the mm. South Australian border. And that is also the direction of our prevailing winds. So, we're getting a lot of grass being carried into the city 
from the Western Districts of Victoria. So it's the number of the grasses mm. that are really the, as you say, public enemy number one because of their affecting of the allergies. Yeah, some things can be quite allergenic, but if we don't see them very often, we very few people develop allergies to them. But guys like this that we see all the time and in large numbers, they cause a lot of allergy problems. Mm. It's interesting about people's perception too. They see a plant, I always mm -hmm. used to have it on the radio when I was answering gardening questions. Yeah. A wattle is in flower, mm -hmm. they get asthma and they think it's attributed to the wattle. Mm. Now, what is your stance on that? Well, we can look at a fair few mm. of these slides. We don't see an awful lot of wattle pollen in the air. We, mostly it sinks to ground and so we don't think of it being uh, commonly in the air and there's not an awful lot of it around. In 2016, Melbourne experienced one of the worst thunderstorm asthma events ever recorded. It led to a citywide crisis with thousands hospitalised and 10 people dead. Thunderstorm asthma is a particular weather conditions, mm -hmm. typically associated with a thunderstorm, and high levels of grass pollen. In Melbourne, it's grass pollen. Grass pollen itself is too big to get into the lungs. Uh, so it affects the eyes and the nose and other parts of the mouth and it can cause hay fever, mm. but those weather conditions, they cause a fragmentation of the grass pollen into smaller, finer particles. Those particles are small enough to get into the lungs and that's where it causes asthma. And people found they couldn't do what's the most basic thing that people need to do, which is to breathe. Mm. Uh, and that's the, the trigger of asthma. Since that crisis, Ed's team have developed a way of forecasting severe pollen days so people and health services can prepare. Pollen counting is all about what happened yesterday. Mm. What people are mostly interested in is what hap is happening in the future, today and tomorrow. Uh, and for that, we have to go to the sky. And information from satellites which are looking at the greening of Australia uh, as we come from winter into spring and, and summer. And it's the quality of those grasses, the vigour of those grasses, which is producing the pollen, uh, and then it's all about moving that pollen from the places where it's produced out in the countryside and into the city where it can affect people. And one of those helpful things is the pollen app. It gives you a lot of information about what sorts of pollen are around for the next week, and it can also tell us about your symptoms. And then we can start to figure out a bit more about that pattern of hay fever in, in Australia. Mm. Pollen is crucial for life on Earth as we know it. But spare a thought for the researchers who are literally counting these microscopic grains of pollen by hand. Mm -hmm.